I hope you are safe and also your family as well. Innoity is an IT and digital consulting company uh, with a disruptive position in the market. Our goal is to know the best IT talent in Europe uh, in order to manage his career path <clears throat> and give them the best advices for their professional career. And actually, we work with our consultant as a football scout with, does with a football player <clears throat> or as an agent does with movie actors. Um, we launched a company 10 years ago in France and four years ago in Spain. We are now a team of 350 people all over the world and we are something more than 50 people in Spain. Today we are really happy to be here. Um, we are more than 50 people attending the, this webinar. Uh, we have people attending from Barcelona, from Madrid, also from the US. As you know, today we are going to speak about uh, the new relic case, huge scale, small cluster, using cell to scale in the cloud. We will try to learn the principle of cell architecture, how new relic has applied them to shift from, from single huge cluster to many smaller clusters and how you can think about it in your own architecture. Thank you very much um, to our speaker, Andrew Blomgarden. Andrew is Senior Principal Software Engineer in New Relic. He lives in Spitsburg, Pennsylvania. Today, uh, we'll have a one hour webinar with a presentation of 40 minutes. At the end of the presentation, we'll have the opportunity to make questions to Andrew. Please write your question uh, on Zoom, on the wall, preguntas and respuestas, better than in the chat. Um, we will record the chat and we'll probably send the replay uh, by Meetup and also we'll probably send you the slide by Meetup. So thank you very much to all of you for being here, here today, enjoy the webinar, and I let Andrew start. Yes, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to start just by introducing myself a little bit more. Um, as Shadam said, I'm a senior principal software engineer at New Relic, and while I'm from Los Angeles, I live in Pittsburgh these days. Um, in my time at New Relic, I've built a bunch of different things, worked with a lot of different people on a lot of different problems. Um, including really big things like NRDB, our in-house database. I'll be talking about that some in this talk, but also little things that are really valuable for customers, like being able to drag on a chart and zoom into a time period. Um, and on the side, I'm a semi-professional choral singer, including on this recording with the Pittsburgh Symphony. You can go listen to it. Um, I'm really looking forward to singing coming back after the pandemic. So with that, I'm gonna get into the talk. I'm gonna start out by talking about an example. Not my own example, but an example that you may have seen uh, last year in 2020 when Amazon Kinesis went down in US East One in Northern Virginia. And I don't say this, uh, talk about this to pick on Amazon. I talk about it because Amazon, big Amazon outages are really unusual and it's always interesting to dig in and see what happened. So whenever these happen, you get headlines like this saying there was a big outage. It took down a big chunk of the internet. There was one of these yesterday when Kinesis went down. Um, so, okay, people use AWS a lot. And Amazon published a pretty useful RCA document explaining what happened during the incident. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the triggering cause and uh, what, what actually happened, and then dig into the whys and what we can learn from that later in the talk. So according to this document, the trigger of this large outage that cascaded from Kinesis to other services that depend on Kinesis and customers that use Kinesis was just from a small addition of capacity. This is a normal thing that any operator does, but it caused a huge outage. And the reason that this happened was it triggered a latent problem in the system where suddenly the number of threads on all the servers in the fleet exceeded the maximum number of threads allowed by the OS configuration. This is a really scary problem. And I'm, you know, you know much sympathy to those at Amazon who are dealing with this. Um, you know, it's the kind of incident that uh, makes me lose sleep. So with that in mind, I'm gonna take a trip back in the past to when I, I first started at New Relic to 2010. In 2010, New Relic's architecture was really, really simple. 
we had, I don't know, something like 10 servers um, running in Engine Yard. We had the same code base written in Ruby, our UI and our collection tier deployed two different places. Queries would come in to get data written by the other thing. And there were a bunch of databases in the back end, SQL databases. This was a really simple architecture, but already we were starting to make changes. Shortly after I started, a couple of smart engineers rewrote the collection tier in Java. And this was a huge win for the company, taking something like a hundred millisecond response time down to 10 or one, you know, it was a big, big improvement. Another thing to give you a character, characterization of the flavor of what New Relic was like at this time was we moved our data center, our presence rather to Chicago. And in the course of this move, we shut down the service for an hour, hours at a time, which is something that we could do. We were small scale. Um, the fact that we were up at, at all, that we had this great product was what was amazing. But that starts to change. In 2012, we were seeing some more problems and we extracted one, one service. This was our first big service extraction project, putting a Java JRuby based service in front of our time slice databases. Time slices are the data points associated with metrics um, on a time series. And this was you know, a big improvement in response time in availability because we had many, many time slice databases and now the UI didn't have to talk to all of them. The architecture is starting to get more complex. Our CEO went off and started building a thing that he called Dirac as a code name. This is now public as NRDB um, and our insights product. Um, and this is what I started to work on very shortly thereafter. Um, this was our in-house analytics database trying to collect a whole lot more data because we wanted to answer the question when our, uh, the question that we wanted to answer for ourselves and we figured our customers might want to answer as well is seeing the details of individual requests, individual customers of ours, how they were experiencing our product. Averages lie. They don't tell you the full story, but you can look at their individual data and say, oh, they are having a real problem. We need to look at that. This was a huge launch for us, and it started a big service-oriented architecture push for us as well. In 2014, there's one more major change that I want to talk about before I dive into the problems that we've started experiencing. And this is the introduction of Kafka into our architecture. Before in the introduction of Kafka, when we would ingest data, it would come from a customer agent or something sending us data via an HTTP request to a collection endpoint that thing would buffer it in memory, and maybe there's a couple more hops that has to go down before it ends up written to disk in a database somewhere. It would be buffered in memory for each hop, you know, maybe aggregated a little bit, but if something went wrong, if say the process was uh, killed or, you know, got slow or something like that, we would lose data. And again, this is something that maybe would have been okay back in 2010, it was starting to become much less okay. And so we started rolling out Kafka, this new technology that allowed us to buffer data onto disk and get it off very quickly. Um, it was well designed for our use case. So five hosts in Kafka, you know, handling all our data, NRDB, tens of hosts maybe, you know, still not huge. But fast forward four years to 2018. By this time, we've done a lot of other things. We've scaled a lot. We have hundreds of services owned by 40 to 50 teams. Um, mostly running in one big DCOS cluster, DCOS being Mesos and Marathon um, in our case, uh, coordinating all of these different containerized services. And in fact, you know, we don't have all our architecture even more. In, a, in our European region, we'd actually containerize everything, not just the stateless services that we're running in DCOS. Um, and I get, I've given a couple talks about this before. I'm including the links here for you to look at later if you would like. Um, this was our European region project. At this point, we had 7,000 JVMs in NRDB. That's uh, you know, well, well, well up from tens of hosts, each of which had a few JVMs on it. This is a, a, you know, I don't think any of us really expected it to get to this point. We had the largest Kafka in the world, Kafka cluster in the world. And there's an asterisk here because there's no like leaderboard for Kafka clusters. It lets you see, ah, yeah, we were on top, but we would go talk to people and we would say, hey, this is the scale that we're operating Kafka at. And uh, they would say, that's interesting. I don't think we know anyone bigger than that. So this is, you know, an okay place to be. We're kind of proud of ourselves. But the scary thing is that we double our scale every 18 months. We'd gone from that relatively small scale in 2014 to get to that place in 2018 over the course of four years. And we had another, another doubling ahead of us. So just playing that forward, imagining it, we knew that we would have more and larger services and an even bigger DCOS cluster. We'd have 
14,000 JVMs in NRDB if we kept playing it forward. We'd have the way largest Kafka cluster in the world. And all of this is particularly scary because any incident in Kafka, NRDB, or in between could affect all of our customers. And we didn't know when we would hit a scaling wall or what we would do when that would happen. And then we had an incident. In 2018, we had a deployment of NRDB that took down our shared Zookeeper cluster. Just a moment. Thank you. Took down our shared Zookeeper cluster. So this was something that we had tried out in our staging environment. We deployed it there. It had seemed fine. And then at production scale, it had triggered what it turned out was a quadratic or possibly even cubic uh, issue in the code that we had talking to Zookeeper. And the scary thing about this was, you know, yet the incident happened, but also we had no other cluster that was 7,000 JVMs large that we could test with. That would have been cost prohibitive for us to, prohib to provision at the time. So, okay, this is bad. Um, maybe we should be really careful with what we roll out to NRDB. But the goal of this deployment was actually to get us past the scaling wall. We were trying to fix a problem where we couldn't add more JVMs to the system because the coordination system was reaching a limit. Oops, we, we're in trouble here. This is not good. So let's keep doing what we're doing. This is not a good idea. We can't rely on the unknown, unlikely, not happening as our reliability strategy. Everything can be fine, can be fine. We can have maybe a little small incident here and there. But if we have this risk of just massive incidents because of something that was seen fine, that's a really scary place for us to be. And I want to call out a quote from Jeff Dean, a very famous engineer from Google, um, talking about how uh, the right design at some scale may be very, very wrong, 10 times that or 100 times that. So if we design this for 10x growth, had it come time to rewrite it, to really reimagine it? And the answer was yes. We had scaled a ton. This is when I started at New Relic on the far left. And just by 2017, that's way over 100 times. And yes, we had re-architected our system some along the way. Um, but this fundamental notion of the big clusters, we hadn't revisited that. So I'm here to talk about something that is not invented here, really. Um, and I want to talk about it motivated by how I first learned about this architecture. And that is another Amazon outage, the great S3 outage of 2017. I said that I live in Pittsburgh, but I happen to be in Portland, Oregon, where many of my colleagues are in our office there um, when this happened. And we were all in one big conference room trying to figure out what to do, frantically changing systems, because S3 had, in my memory, never gone down completely in Northern Virginia. So we looked at the RCA, and the trigger was something that is very relatable to me. Someone made a mistake, and a larger set of servers was removed from a cluster than it was intended. But Amazon started talking more about what they do to prevent incidents in the first place. And they started talking about factoring services into cells. And at this point, I had never heard this term. And I asked other people at New Relic, hey, is this something that you know about? No one had. But it talks about how cells are for able to, they let engineering teams assess and test recovery um, at, at a certain known scale. So this would be really powerful. Um, and I started Googling around and found this blog post from High Scalability, talking about it just from 2012. So it was clearly an idea that was well around. A cell architecture is based on the idea that massive scale requires parallelization, and parallelization requires components to be isolated from each other. These islands of isolation are called cells. And a cell is a self-contained installation that can satisfy all the operations for each other. All right, this is sounding good. They can be added in an incremental fashion as more capacity is required. They isolate failures and they can be distributed across data centers. So these three things were really attractive to us. They gave us the, the hope of a scalable future for our systems with some limited blast radius and also the possibility of moving to the cloud. So the reason that, uh, or I should say back in 2015, we had had an internal project where we talked about, should we move to the cloud? And we looked into it and we determined, you know, one of the major concerns we had was how we would successfully migrate it all, how we would do it in a way without customer impact. 
And this was a possible strategy forward. So, okay. I've talked a lot. What's the sell? The reality is it's a pattern. So it's different for every company for different services and systems at those companies and at different times in the company and services life cycles. So let's go back to that Kinesis outage to talk a little bit about that and dig into what it said. The trigger again was this relatively small addition of capacity, but Kinesis already had these backend cell clusters. So that shouldn't have triggered a problem, but those backend cell clusters, which do the real work of the system of stream processing, um, they have a front end in front of them. That's the facade um, to make Kinesis seem like a bigger, uh, one big system. And it you know, does an important job like authentication, throttling and routing. And that was not cellularized. So latent bug, not cellularized, big incident. So unsurprisingly, the RCA said, you know, Amazon wants to accelerate the cellularization of the front end feed and talks more about the benefits. Um, and notably that cellularization would provide better protection against any future unknown scaling limit. And I think this is the key here, that it protects you against problems you don't know are there. There are other instances of this that are public. Azure talks about in a blog post from, or I sorry, a magazine article from 2017 about Azure App Service. Um, I don't know if this is still accurate, but at least at the time um, when deploying applications, uh, this GeoMaster service would look around and see which scale units had room for it. And those scale units were isolated. Azure also talks about this as a stamp-based architecture. Salesforce back in 2013, again from high scalability, has a notion of instances uh, where customers are assigned and provide isolation and scaling. And notably, Salesforce can move customers between these. And this is visible to customers, but should be zero impact if you follow their instructions. So I've talked a lot about cells in general, the principles, you know, the, the, the goals, I should say. Um, but now I want to talk about what we've done at New Relic, getting down to brass tacks, how we've used this and what it's uh, what it's done for us. So I've talked about two out of the three boxes on the bottom here, uh, Kafka and NRDB. We also have something in front for us. This is our edge tier vortex that handles authentication, rate limiting, and also shoving data on disk as fast as possible so we, we don't lose it in future hops. We, so we accept data at vortex, shove it on disk, send it to Kafka, pass it back and forth between a number of pipeline services, and then uh, it gets at rest in NRDB. Okay, so naively, all we need to do here to cellularize it is just do that a lot. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Great. Um, there's, you know, one, well, a number of problems here, I should say. And that is that we present APIs to customers that we can't break. We have our language agent APIs for our APM product, the infrastructure agent APIs, um, our MELT APIs, metrics, events, logs, traces, all of these we can't break. And they present a single new relic to our customers. And similarly, we have APIs and UIs that customers use to query that data. So we need to bridge the gaps here. How does data arrive at a cell in the first place? How do we decide how it goes to which cell? And how do we query the right cell? But again, not all the cells. We want to allow for the possibility of a cell having a real problem and not impact all of our customers. And also, it would be really nice to be able to get rid of a cell. We don't want to be stuck with something that we built five years ago because we can't get rid of it. So I'm going to talk about a couple of the problems and then gloss over a couple of the others um, for the sake of time. First, digging into how do we route an accounts data to the correct cell? We call this account-based routing, very clever. So one of the, some of the requirements here are that we, uh, we couldn't have customer changes um, that were required, um, including IP allow list changes. So we publish an IP block to our customers um, we can't tell them to go change that on any reasonable time scale, especially for a project like this. Um, similarly, our APIs are designed around single host names. So uh, for example, collector.newrelic.com for our APM prompt. We can't go update all of those old agents. Um, and we want it to be possible to move traffic between cells within a few minutes. Um, and I call this out because it basically rules out DNS as an answer for us where you can move most of the traffic between a few minutes if you could manage to have, say, a customer specific host name. Um, but there's a long tail. You can't really trust DNS for the purposes for purposes like this. And we also wanted any latency impact to be nominal. So the solution that we've arrived at um, and what we use today is we use uh, Cloudflare for this. They have a product called Workers that allows us to run arbitrary JavaScript at the edge. So we are able to, for 
all of our different various APIs, look at properties of the request, talk to our, one of our backend systems that we call Wayfinder that can uh, look at that, extract what account it's for, um, uh, and other characteristics of the request, and then decide which cell to send it to. And then Cloudflare can proxy the request on through. This works very well for us. So this is actually applicable to any HTTP traffic routing problem like this. And it's not only possible with Cloudflare, um, although that is what we use. The next problem is great. We now have the ability to route traffic. How do we decide? What are the characteristics that we care about? And there's a trade-off here between data co-location and balancing. So if we, all we cared about were traffic balancing, probably just round robin the traffic across all of our cells, but then we've lost the isolation benefits. Um, we want to allow for the possibility that some customer's traffic um, is badly shaped for us, triggers a bug, um, has a huge spike. And if it's going to cause a problem, we'd like that problem to be isolated. So we want that data to be co-located as best we can. This problem is cell load balancing. And what we do today is we currently route on account and data type tuples. So this is an account's logs all go to one place. An account's metrics all go to one place or perhaps a different place than the logs. And similarly for other big buckets of data types. This is a flexible system so that we can evolve it in the future. But this allows us to you know, roughly bin pack our customers load across our cells. And again, this is implemented via Wayfinder. Wayfinder is the thing that uh, implements this for us. It implements it via a consistent hash across cells. And we can also pin some large accounts to specific cells. Uh, like many large uh, SaaS, uh, SaaS companies, particularly large scale ones, we have you know, very many number of smaller accounts and data type tuples. And then there are some that are very, very large. And we may want to speak those, treat those specially, or at the very least ensure that they don't all stack up on the same cell. And an explicit non-goal here, something we don't want, is for cascading set failure when one cell goes down. So there's no automatic redirection here. Um, we, we do not want uh, one problem to cascade through our systems. As I said, I would talk about a couple problems in some depth, and then some others in less depth. So the other two here are cell to cell transfer. This is what allows us to drain and then eventually remove cells. We can remove uh, petabytes of data between cells uh, with, uh, without um, causing any issues for query, such as um, returning the same data twice or not returning it at all. It's a transactional system that we've built. Uh, and then we also have the ability to uh, route queries smartly across cells. So this is to say, uh, if an account's data has gone in the past to two cells and we've moved it, um, we will query just those two cells rather than some larger number. And this is, again, for the benefit of isolation and also performance. So I'll talk a little more about some key properties of our cells, including one thing that I haven't talked about at all. I've talk, been talking about principles more than anything else. We built this all on top of Kubernetes um, and the cloud. So uh, I mentioned earlier that by 2018, we had hundreds and hundreds of services running across uh, on top of our managed container fabric, our DCOS platform. We didn't have that same benefit for NRDB um, and for other uh, stateful services. Um, we did run them in containers, but they were orchestrated using a, I, I wouldn't say a manual system per se, you know, it's still software doing it, but it is not a, a full-fledged orchestrator like DCOS. Kubernetes is what allowed us the flexibility to write an operator to, op to operate NRDB. And as we were going from one big cluster in our production environment to many more, this was key. This was what allowed us to uh, keep running, keep the same level of service um, without stressing out our engineers um, as we were getting more and more and more clusters in play. Um, and this has been a, a huge success for us. We also use managed services in AWS, such as RDS, managed Kafka, um, and then we have a, a platform on top of each cell, sort of bridging them together for operators perspective. Um, we have a system we call Grand Central internally. This is homegrown, um, but it's on top of Argo for Kubernetes coordinating across clusters. Um, and we use Atlantis and Terraform uh, as well. So all of that is our managed platform. And then because of that, and also for other reasons, we have a goal of having cells be ephemeral. And this is you know, for a few reasons, one of which is that Kubernetes has a uh, relatively fast support cycle. And ideally, you're able to upgrade in place. But sometimes you might run into problems. And giving us the ability to build new cells, move traffic to those, and then tear down old ones gives us a way out of any problems, like a Kubernetes version. 
upgrade problem. And it also allows us to make more fundamental infrastructure level changes. For example, if we wanted to re-IP all of our VPCs, that would be difficult, if not impossible, without rebuilding everything. And so this ephemerality allows for that. And it also ensures that we don't have a, a permanent single point of failure because we've designed with the assumption that these cells have a limited shelf life. And so to support that, ingest must be movable between cells, as I've talked about, state must be movable between cells, and there must be more than one cell of a given type. And I want to talk a little bit about the extent to which we, extent that we've gone to to make that possible, um, even when faced with some real challenges. And that example is Prometheus data. So last year, we released the ability for our customers to send us data via the Prometheus Remote Write API. This is a, a really easy way to send Prometheus data to us. Just add a couple lines to the Prometheus configuration, um, and suddenly all the Prometheus data is being sent to us because we implement the native Remote Write API. And this is really great, but some Prometheus data comes in with semantics that we, um, we have not built our platform to optimize for notably cumulative counters. So for example, a process recording the Prometheus metric with the number of requests since it started, that's going up and up and up and up and up. Typically what customers care about is the overall throughput. So they want the difference between now and the one before, and then over time, add that up, you get a you know, time series chart with the number of requests. Um, so we had a system that translates those the cumulative counters at ingest time into deltas, and then we store the deltas. The problem is that requires a little bit of state. And so if we were, for example, to move data, move ingest between cells for an accounts for Prometheus traffic, it's very difficult to make that an instantaneous migration um, given clocks, distributed systems, it's a hard problem. And so we allow for a little bit of slop, a couple minutes where data can be going to both places at once. And this is fine for almost all of our systems, except here. So message one saying I have 1,000 requests can go to cell one. Message two saying I have 1,100 requests can go to cell two. Message three saying I have 1,500 requests can go to cell one. And suddenly we've recorded a delta of 500, even though the delta was between 1,100 and uh, 1,500. Oops. So we built a system in Cloudflare. Again, this is arbitrary code that we can run at the edge with workers to send data to both cells simultaneously and tell one to, to actually produce the results. Uh, this allows that cell two to come up to speed on what the historical state was, and then we can execute a cutover. At the end, we end up with data in cell two just as we wanted. This was a bunch of work, but we did it because of those, be those benefits of ephemerality are so important for us. So I've talked a lot about the architecture, and I want to talk just a little bit about how we ran our migration, how this has been going. So for each data type we, type we wanted to migrate, we first, in our own production monitoring environment, deploy the pipeline for that data type to the cloud, move some of our own accounts. Um, we use New Relic a lot, so we typically are able to find problems, um, then move the rest. And then we repeat the same thing in production. Uh, we move accounts incrementally, uh, keeping a special eye on any like large or particularly interesting accounts smoke out more problems, and gradually scale up to all on the cloud. You repeat this for every data type, and then you're at where we are, where uh, all of our telemetry and justice process in the cloud. This has been a very successful architecture for us, but there's more, more to come. So I've talked a lot about our telemetry and just systems, but there's also stateless UIs and APIs, and we haven't moved those yet. So for example, our uh, um, one.newrelic.com is not in the cloud today, but we want to move it to the cloud with some of these same benefits. Um, and the way that we're planning on doing that, we're building it now, is with an architecture that uh, deploys each of these services across more than one cell and allows us to lose one Kubernetes cluster, one cell, without impact. The problem is different and also simpler than our telemetry and just problem. So this is our plan for migrating that vast fleet of smaller but business critical systems to the cloud. Another one is alerts to the cloud. So our telemetry and jet systems are generally speaking, uh, I should say stateless in the streaming land um, while then stateful in terms of data at rest. And we built that stateful cell-to-cell uh, -cell transfer system to account for that. Alerts are harder because we need to aggregate data correctly in one place for a given alert. Uh, it's really important 
for our customers to not get uh, incorrectly alerted because we say split aggregation between two places and computed the wrong result. So we're working now on cellularizing this architecture, perhaps with something like what I've shown on the screen, um, where we have a uh, um, pipeline that allows us to correctly aggregate data in just one place. So I've talked a lot about our cell architecture, principles of cell architecture. I want to talk a little bit about lessons you can learn. So just to reiterate some, with isolation, the be isolation benefits of cell architecture, you can isolate the impact of customer in driven or your own issues to a subset of customers, perhaps even uh, possibly even just one customer. Um, so for example, you can run deploys in succession across cells and hopefully catch any issues um, without affecting your entire customer base, or if you can uh, absorb you know, customer driven impact. You can add more cells to scale. Um, cells and an architecture like it makes it easier to move into more than one data center or region or possibly even clouds. Um, this architecture is designed to just let you do the same thing over and over and over. And yes, there are problems with introducing geographic distance, but they're more tractable. And then ephemerality makes it possible to rotate an infrastructure um, because you have more than one deployment. So all of that said, is this worth the cost? It really depends on what the problems you're dealing with are. If you're at a startup and you're trying to find product market fit, this is probably not a good idea. Um, this is a heavy investment. At the same time, if you think you found it, or if the chance of great success, fast success is really possible, and you need to have a large footprint that needs to grow quickly, then maybe, yeah, this is appropriate. Um, and certainly, if you start with this architecture, it is easier than having to retrofit it. But I want to talk a little bit about some possible intermediate steps. First off, taking that, uh, that goal of ephemerality is probably very valuable if you're running in the cloud. It's really hard to get right from the beginning. So building in more than one VPC and more than one AWS account, for example, allows you to avoid baking in assumptions around having just the one. Service-oriented architectures are you know, understandably very popular. We use it. Whoops. Excuse me. Service-oriented architectures are very popular um, for good reason, but they're also incredibly expensive at scale um, in terms of engineering complexity and time. Yes, they solve some problems, but they introduce many others. So I, one thing I want to draw your attention to is that it's probably more important to avoid monolithic databases than monolithic services. Because databases, data is really hard to move, it's to split up after the fact. And then for isolation, I want to talk a little bit about shuffle sharding. This is something else that uh, I first heard about from Amazon. I um, mean, it's a related concept that I think is really powerful. And shuffle sharding is isolation VMF. So the idea behind this is, uh, is two things. One, you can, uh, in, in, uh, you can achieve greater reliability than just the cell architecture that I've talked about um, with shuffle sharding, or you can take a non-cellular architecture and get the same isolation benefits and reliability benefits that I was talking about. So here's the idea. You have N shards available to process customer data. Maybe that's N processes, maybe that's N cells. And you choose for each customer or some other unit that you care about, the same M shards, smaller than N, to uh, process them. So for example, with eight total shards, you choose two to process, um, let's say, rainbow customers' data. And if you do that, uh, uh, a really surprising property emerges. If something goes wrong with rainbow customers' data, this is, again, from AWS, um, you, have, you have knocked out two of the eight shards, but all of the other customers are unaffected in this arbitrary configuration of emoji mappings to shards. But the math is really powerful. If you instead have 2048 shards and you choose four shards for each of your customers, you have uh, 730 billion unique combinations, which means that uh, unless you have anywhere near that number of customers, the odds of you having a problem that impacts more than one customer, if you can successfully do this, is really, really low. And one reason I talk about this, in addition to encouraging you to go read that article in more detail, is because shuffle charting requires the ability to route by customer or resource. So if you can manage to do this, if you can have shuffle charting on top of, say, your single large cluster, 
that will make cellularization easier in the future. One more thing that I want to mention before uh, uh, I'm done with this talk is that a lot of this um, is inspired by this excellent talk from Amazon from Peter Vossall in 2018. I highly, I highly encourage you to watch it. So that's my talk. Thank you so much. Um, and now I will turn it over to Arnaud. Thank you, Arnaud. Thanks, thanks. Thanks a lot, Andrew. This was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words. This is Arnaud Panosa, uh, Senior Director of Software Engineering um, at New Relic in Barcelona. Uh, well, I guess you're all familiar with, with what we do at New Relic. I mean, this is, we are an observability company and we are ingesting telemetry data for, from many different sources, from infrastructure, APM, logs, browser, mobile. Uh, and we also have like alerting, well, AI powered alerting on top of it, uh, which, you know, uh, and, and you, you've seen some of these pieces uh, in Andrew's talk, uh, maybe not the alerting one, but anyway. Um, so uh, just wanted to, encourage you all to try out our free tier. So we have, uh, if you've not accessed our website, please do. We have uh, 100 gigabytes of ingest data per month that are free forever. And you have access to the, our full suite of products. So I use it in my personal, in my personal uh, you know, tech projects. I really encourage you to, use, to do that and do the same. Uh, anyway, so also the other thing is we are hiring our office in Barcelona is growing. Our other offices in the States and also in Tel Aviv are also growing. Um, but anyway, uh, if uh, so, just wanted to let you know that we have positions for backend engineers, which probably it's, it's what's more uh, relevant for this talk, but also for front end, for experience designers, engineering managers. If you know people, do not hesitate. We're building a great team. You have a lot of fun with you know all these kind of challenges that Andrew was was describing. Um, uh, so yeah, please do that. I'll share in the chat window just uh, this link so you can just copy paste it to access our career website. And I will also send you my LinkedIn profile. So if you you know you prefer to just contact me directly, feel free to do so. Happy to to answer. I'll, I'll be I'll be glad to to meet you. Uh, with that, I'll just uh, you know we can hand it over to to Q and A. You can use the Q and A section in the Zoom. And Andrew will, I assume, gladly answer your questions. Don't ask me because I won't be able to answer. Thank you, Anna. Yes, yeah, so you can write your question on, on Zoom if there is any question. Does someone has any question to for Andrew? Don't be shy. And if you have any questions afterwards that you think of, feel free to send me a message on Twitter. Um, it's, it'll be in the slides at the end of this or hit me up on LinkedIn. Yeah, so we have one question. Um, how much people did it take to do the transition to sales? People in the tech team? Uh, I don't have a precise number. I would say that probably in the course of this project, there have been a couple hundred people involved, not all at the same time. I've talked about a lot of different systems. It's been various phases over time, but you know, this has affected our entire telemetry data platform um, and has been our our scaling strategy and reliability strategy. So it's been a big project. Okay. 
So it seems we're not have more questions. Probably next to the event we'll be able to we'll receive some. Okay, thank you, Arnau. Thank you, Vanessa, also for making the, the event possible. Thank you very much, Andrew. Some, you. Comment, some comments are coming. Great presentation. Thank you, congrats. So, thanks to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Jerome. Thanks, Vanessa. Bye.